Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is the Oculture Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show, wherever you are and however you're listening. Thanks for being here. Hey, our guest tonight is one of the first guests to share the airwaves with me back in episode 5. His name is Peter Biebergall, and he's written maybe the coolest book you'll read this year. Actually, there's no maybe about it. It's the coolest. It's called Strange Frequencies, the extraordinary story of the technological quest for the supernatural. And it's a journey through the attempts that artists, scientists, and tinkerers have made to imagine and communicate with the otherworldly using various technologies from cameras to radio waves to maybe even something like this here podcast. Which makes sense, because technology has been used for centuries to bridge the gap between the material and the mystical, revealing that the workshop and the seance parlor have more in common than we might think, and if technology is the bridge between worlds, then I say we're living in the most magical time in recorded human history. So let's flick on our spirit radio, light up our magic lanterns, and prepare to be dazzled by the audio magic of Peter Biebergall. Enjoy! Peter Biebergall, welcome back, man. It's very nice to have you here again. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, it's been quite a long time. I think maybe over a year and a half, maybe even two years. I think it's almost two years. You were episode five of this show when I first started it. And man, I got to thank you for that because I had virtually no audience and you were willing to come on and talk about your last book, Season of the Witch, How the Occult Stayed Rock and Roll. Great chat there. I got some really good feedback on that when it came out. So. I think we'll do some damage again this time for sure with your new book. It's called Strange Frequencies, The Extraordinary Story of the Technological Quest for the Supernatural. Dude, I know I already said this to you on Twitter. I got three pages into the introduction, and I thought it was the coolest thing that I've read this year. And (laughs) after finishing the rest of it, I I stand by that statement. It's, It's such a cool book, you know, like, I don't know what cool means anymore, but it was cool to me. And I'd like up front here to just give the audience some background on what the book is about, like where it came from, you know, why you wrote this book to begin with. Well, I think in some ways it's, it's an important extension of what I had been doing with season of the witch. I mean, season of the witch was specifically about rock and roll, but the larger thematic idea that I was interested in is one that I'm defining as the occult imagination, which is this broad spectrum of the ways in which we interact with occult, esoteric, alternative, spiritual ideas or symbols. And it's not even necessarily about the practices themselves, of which we know the word occult is so mercurial of a word in trying to define We can all agree it generally applies to a broad range of practices and beliefs that seem to share some essential thing in common, which is that it's often, even though occult practices arise out of traditional religious communities, they're often considered heterodox or unorthodox or dangerous within those communities, sometimes. But more often than not, they tend to be about the individual taking control of their own interactions with some spiritual reality. And it often involves some manipulation of uh, of symbols, of materials, of words, of the way those words are expressed. And so I, I've always been intrigued by the idea that the occult has these tends to often have material components. You know, I remember as a kid when I first stumbled upon the book, the key of Solomon, the King, and I thought this was just this incredible text that first of all, I was amazed that as a, as a young 
uh, suburban Jewish kid to find this magical text in this bookstore in Salem that was just replete with Hebrew characters and symbols. But one of my favorite pages of that book when I was probably 12 years old is the a drawing of all the magical implements. You know, <laughs> that was like the coolest thing to me. This idea that you would need all you would you would sort of need all these tools. You would need to sort of have these material elements to be able to perform these magical activities. And so that idea of of tool using magicians, I guess, became something that I've always been very inspired by. And as I was starting to think about what I wanted to do for my next project, I knew that I wanted to continue with this idea of exploring the occult imagination in some other part of our of our shared human experience. And I became friendly with the photographer Shannon Taggart, who uh, she was introduced to me by Pam Grossman, a dear friend of mine, who I'm sure you know and your listeners know. And Shannon is someone who photographs mediums, often in their trance states, and uses the camera itself to to allow for sort of error or glitch within the experience of taking the camera. And on the other side of that, there usually is some phenomena, you could argue, that is in that is contained in the resulting photograph, even though that phenomena may not be visible when you're actually watching the medium. And anyway, so I realized this camera itself was acting sort of as one of these magical implements to activate. And this is a really important thing for me to activate the occult or 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 supernatural imagination. And I think what what's important about that idea activate is that the for me the metaphysical reality of these things at least and i want to say for the purposes of this book and even for season of the witch it is not really the question that i'm asking here i'm not asking can we really communicate with spirits that's an interesting question on its own it's not one that i'm either qualified to try to answer nor did i set out to try to answer it with this book what i wanted to try to investigate was how, and what I discovered working with Shannon and then the extension of that, is how technology, oddly, has historically been a very useful means by which people have activated this part of their imagination and have come into some state of consciousness which allows them to connect with, to work with, to to create expressions of this supernatural, potential supernatural reality. So technology, it becomes an activating mechanism for our occult imagination. And so that that's sort of how it came about. But, it, it you know, at the at the base answer is I saw Shannon's photographs. I was completely blown away by them and thought there might be a way of connecting this idea of the camera and by extension, other technologies to the ends of, of having an interaction with the occult imagination. Yeah, man. And I think you took my next two points away from me, which is fine. But, you know, <laughs> my next thing was going to be, you know, yeah, the occult imagination, I felt, even though it wasn't directly stated, was the actual foundation for the book. And I wanted to know why you explored it again. And that is what you just told us. And also, you know, you mentioned this too a little bit uh, about that anecdote, finding the key of Solomon in the bookstore when you were a kid. But I got the impression that in your childhood that you yourself exhibited a pretty healthy occult imagination. You mentioned in the book that you've been building simple circuits since you were a kid. And that really plays well with the theme of the book here. How does one get started building things like that, simple circuits or technology that young? Like, where did that interest come from? And do you think that it was sort of destined for you to to write this book and sort of come full circle? I mean, it's a very funny connection there because I feel like my whole childhood was built around a kind of DIY sensibility. And it has to do with, in many ways, it's it's a result of becoming interested in well, always interested in monster movies and horror movies. But if you were in the 1970s, like if you were reading magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland or Creepy and Eerie, there was just something kind of 
they weren't glossy, beautifully produced magazines. You know, they were on cheap newsprint. They just even that, like looking at an old issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland now, there are fanzines today that are better quality than those <laughs> magazines, you know. So there was always this sense that the things that I was interested in was a little bit off center, a little bit to the side, and that the people who were involved when doing them were doing them mostly out of a labor of love. And then I became interested in role-playing games. And again, in the late 70s and very early 80s, role-playing games were very much a DIY sensibility in terms of, uh, you know, if you look at like the old Judges Guild modules and supplements for Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, again, this stuff looks like it was made and, you know, photocopied in somebody's basement. And it's because the community was small. And so it was really people who were just trying to reach other like-minded people as opposed to trying to reach a much broader audience. And eventually I became interested in, in more than interested. I mean, my, my life was consumed by hardcore punk in the early 80s. And the funny thing is, is those those punk rock fanzines looked very much like those Judges Guild D&D supplements, right? There was something very underground about the whole thing. And I was just always attracted to the way in which communities could just build their own material artifacts for the things that they were interested in. And around this time, I mean, I think it's all it, it's not about me. It's about it's about the it's about the culture and it's about the 1970s and early 80s, I think. And it was also around this time that DIY electronics was very popular. I mean, it had been obviously for a long time with things like uh, ham radios and things in the 50s and then into the 60s. But by the time you get into the 70s, with transistors becoming incredibly cheap to mass produce. There was really a boom in consumer do-it-yourself electronics. And so there was a company called Heathkit. And you could buy kits and build, you know, your own stereo equipment. And some of that, some of the Heathkit stereo equipment today is considered to be very collectible because it was incredibly well made. I mean, as long as the person who was putting it together knew what they were doing. But all you had to do was follow the solder direction. So, you know, I could go to Radio Shack say 1978, I could walk into a Radio Shack and I could buy a little kit. And all I needed was a solder gun and a pair of needle nose pliers and I could bring it home and I could set it up on the kitchen table and I could build a little a little radio or a little tester of some kind. And so if you knew where to look and you were interested in these things, there was a whole culture that made these kinds of things possible. And so in, in, in some very real ways, my childhood is a spectrum of monsters, Dungeons and Dragons, an interest in magic, and in sort of do it do it yourself electronics. And the soundtrack was punk rock, <laughs> you know. So, so that <laughs> yeah. that that's sort of the. I guess it would only make sense that I would write a book like Season of the Witch and Strange Frequencies. Ultimately, I would agree with that. And one of the things I liked in the book is a very simple thing that you did. But I thought it was absolutely necessary to differentiate between these terms. I like how you broke down the difference between the terms occult, supernatural, and paranormal. I was wondering if you could do that for us here. Yeah, I think I want to say that I know that that's very, it's a very controversial issue. And part of the reason why it's controversial, and I, uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this too, but we can get into that. But essentially, I, I make make these definitions partly just for making sense of the way that I use those terms in the book. But I think they, they speak to something more important, which we can talk about. But the first is I define the occult, again, as this broad spectrum of practices, usually having some religious or spiritual identity built around them, that there is the divine, that we can interact with the divine, there is the infernal, potentially we can interact with the infernal, but there is an otherworldly reality, a reality beyond this one that through certain practices, through the certain manipulation of, of, of material objects and ideas, the individual or group can have a direct interaction with this reality. And that includes things like ceremonial magic witchcraft, 
divination techniques, using tarot cards, using corresponding gemstones, herbs, colors, all of those things which can induce these states of magical consciousness. So that's that's sort of how I define the occult. I define the supernatural as it, which is, I think, much more intimately related to it as the intersection of the, those otherworldly realities with the phenomenal world. I would say in some ways that going into, you know, performing cere- ceremonial magic to uh, bind a demon, that I'm calling magic. But a spirit haunting a house is on the spectrum for me, at least in the context of this book, as a supernatural. But I, but I think those things are intimately related because we're because magic is often interacting with a supernatural reality. The outlier for me here really is the paranormal, and I define the paranormal as having to do more with the possible potential of the human mind to to use senses beyond the ones that we have to interact with this reality not necessarily to interact with a supernatural or an occult reality so esp telekinesis telepathy and i also think that the paranormal at least in the 70s as these things started to become defined in the pop culture is more aligned is even aligned with things like um potentially UFOs, Bigfoot, sightings, Loch Ness Monster, sort of things that that have the potential to be measured in that way. Does that make sense? I think the measuring of of being able to measure those things, uh, to be able to sort of do research on them, like the Rhine Institute. And it's very interesting because I had a conversation with with some folks at the Rhine Institute when I was writing this book. And one of the things that he said to me, the fellows, I don't have his name, but I can get it to you. One of the interesting things that he said to me is that they actually find that um, ideas about the supernatural are detrimental to the work that they do at the Rhine. So, for example, he said that when they're when people come to them saying that they've experienced poltergeist activity, they often attribute that kind of thing to subconscious experiences of telekinesis so when somebody's in their bedroom and things start flying around and the person thinks that it's spirits the rhine institute is more likely to say that that was a telekinetic event as a result of some potential trauma that was buried in this person's psyche and is coming out via this paranormal activity and they actually find that that this that sort of the ghost hunting part of pop culture is not of is not of benefit to the to the work that they do. So they they are also some folks are also making some of these similar distinctions. I also I think for me personally, and this is I think where it's going to get controversial, is that I think that working with the occult in the way that I define it. Has, is more about consciousness than it is about physical reality. And so I'm more in line, say, with uh, somebody like Alan Moore, who talks about magic as magic and art as, as functionally the same, the same thing, whereby via a transformation or an alteration of consciousness, you are changing the material world, not in its physics, but by adding this new thing to it, which in that way would be a, a piece of a piece of art. And it's it's in that interaction between our consciousness and the expression of that consciousness that the gods live and that we can have that experience with the divine. And so for the purposes of this book, it was very important to me to let people know that I wasn't going to be talking about ESP. I wasn't going to be talking about telekinesis. I wasn't going to be talking about near-death experiences or any of those kinds of uh, more measurable phenomena. I'm really talking about the ways in which people have tried to use technology to, again, to activate or to interact with what I want to call spiritual or occult sensibilities, if that makes sense. I'm not sure that 
I, I know that those definitions are, are, again, like we said at the beginning, very mercurial, and they often bleed into each other. And I know for many practitioners, they don't make those distinctions in some ways. But at least for the purposes of this book, I think it was important for me to to let the readers know what my what the parameters were going to be. Well, I don't think that, to me, that's not very controversial at all, especially the art magic portion, which is really the foundation of the podcast here. That's kind of the way that I approach it as well. I mean, if you think about it, the way you described it, the paranormal was, like you said, more of the uh, the material version of this sort of phenomena that, that you can measure, right? Maybe more psychological components that you can access and then replicate, I guess, somehow. And uh, the occult and supernatural, yeah, they they sort of are the same thing. Like the occult is maybe the tools to access whatever exists in the supernatural there. So yeah, yes, I would not right. disagree with any of that. That's why I, I asked that question. I like the way that you differentiated between the three and because they are very similar words. And I think in some circles they may be used interchangeably, but I don't think that they should be. So Real quickly, though, there's one interesting thing. I, I, I've i never been able to find the quote again, and if any of your listeners know it, and maybe they could add a, put a comment or something, but there was somewhere that Alan Watts had written that he makes a distinction between what he calls psychic phenomena and spiritual phenomena. And he argues that psychic phenomena is not spiritual phenomena because it's happening in the phenomenal world, and spiritual things happen in the spiritual world. And that once you cross over to the material, you're no longer in the realm of the spiritual. And so I think I'm just I'd like to find that quote because it's always I remember reading it as a teenager. I've never been able to find it again. I know it's Alan Watts. I don't know quite. I don't remember what book it's in, but that that idea has always had an impact on me. And I know, again, it's, you know, there's different ways that you can understand that. But I, I really appreciate the essence of what he's getting at there. Yeah, I'm not sure what quote you're talking about, but just the way that you laid it out there, you're kind of singing my song again there. So I'm wondering, Peter, do you think it's necessary to believe in the occult or the supernatural in order to engage with it? Absolutely not. And in fact, I think that the thing that I'm most interested in, again, is something that that, that became really apparent to me in working with Shannon, is this idea of learning how to live with these ideas in ambiguous and liminal states of being. I, I, I use this metaphor a lot, but when you go see a magic trick, uh, let's say you go see a stage magician, you know going into it that you that it's a trick, that, that the magician is not wielding infernal powers to produce some effect that could not be explained. We know that going in. And yet there is a moment, almost like a trance-like state, in which for a split second there's we live inside the ambiguity and the liminality of what just took place. And then and we move in and out of that, you know, all the time in those moments. We say, Oh, maybe he had a little contraption over there, or I wonder if it's hiding within her sleeve, or whatever the thing might be. But but within that, there are these almost immeasurable time periods where we – it's not even that we know or we don't know. It's that we exist almost outside of the experience in an ambiguous and liminal place where we allow ourselves to be enchanted. And it's that experience of enchantment that I'm the most interested in. And I think that we have lost the ability to become enchanted in those ways. I think what happens is the moment, and we see this in the history of religion, really, right? The moment we're enchanted, we try to codify it and then turn it into something dogmatic rather than, or we want to quickly try to explain it away. And those are both reasonable things to want to do. But I want to understand more about those split seconds of enchantment and how we can extend how we can extend that to exist in those states of mind longer. And I think interaction with occult and magical ideas, symbols, stories, pieces of art, playing with tarot cards, using the I Ching, whatever it is, that we can place ourselves into those states of being 
try to live in them. Sometimes they're uncomfortable, right? Sometimes they're uncomfortable places to be, to activate those parts of our imagination and to see what emerges. Maybe we'll learn something about ourselves. Maybe we'll learn something about our own beliefs. Maybe we'll want to write a short story or paint or sculpt or whatever it is. But I think that learning how to live inside a state of enchantment, which again can be an uncomfortable, ambiguous place to be, is what I think is the the, the highest value of magical and occult ideas. So let's kind of bring technology into this and, you know, how that may affect our state of enchantment here. You know, in the book, you were talking early on in it about spirits entering through TVs and the film Poltergeist. And you said that technology was not only the medium for the message, it was the medium for the spirits themselves. Obviously, that's the case in that film. But what about in our little corner of our universe here? Did technology usher in something fierce here, something supernatural or occult, something ghostly? Well, it's a very interesting idea. I think what it what it speaks to is that technology did not, let's put it this way, technology did not bury those beliefs. In fact, people immediately turned around and saw them as tools to have maybe even better, more direct interactions. So if you look at the history of, say, spirit photography, spiritualists would write about spirit photography. And one of the things that they would often write about is how the spirits needed us to invent the camera so that they could communicate with us in this way. They're sort of waiting. The spirit world has been waiting for us to become smart enough, technologically advanced enough to be able to create a tool through which they could finally communicate with us in the way that they had wanted to. You could argue that people, people with the advent of, of the telegraph and the radio, that people similarly believed, okay, now finally we have something by which the spirits can move along the electromagnetic fields and finally interact with us in ways that they couldn't before. Before they had to use dreams, they had to rap on tables, they had to throw books off shelves or whatever it was, and now they have more direct means. But the truth of the matter is, is I think that the camera, the radio, whatever it is, are really just more advanced or more complicated divinatory devices that we've been using since the beginning of time. So I really don't see the difference between say, a radio trying to tune in the frequencies of a spirit and John Dee's scene stones that he used to try to communicate with the angels in which the story goes, he learned the Enochian language. It's just a more sophisticated version of a scene stone. So we've always been doing this. But as technology increases, as we become more adept at manipulating the physical world, it would only make sense then that we would continue to we would use these things in the same way it just might be that the way in which the spirits or at least the belief that the spirits can express themselves is much more dramatic so we don't have we have john d stones in the british museum but we don't can't look at them and see the smoky visage of a of an angelic beam but we can certainly look at some of the the turn-of-the-century spirit photographs and see those because the technology has allowed for a more contained way of producing those effects or those realities. depends on what you believe. So I think they're all extensions of the same thing we've always been doing. And so what I find fascinating is as technology increased, people didn't say, well, I guess science has really dominated our lives. There really can't be spiritual reality. People said, wait a minute. What if I open up this radio and flip some wires around? Maybe I could get this to communicate with spirits. Have you seen that, I don't know what I would call it, a theory or an idea? It's floating around online somewhere probably. But have you have you heard this theory or idea that the keyboard is like an input device for spirit communication? That like certain keys and codes and commands 
summon certain kinds of spirits like beyond your knowledge obviously yeah yeah just yeah no that's that's wild that almost veers into a kind of like um it reminds me of certain forms of schizophrenia right where you're trying to use various arrangements of symbols to create meanings right there's like a, a you know and i think what's interesting about this is you know that they're to use schizophrenia only as a metaphor not in a negative way but to say you know this this way in which meaning just gets layered on and layered on and layered on and there really is no sort of perfect answer there's just with every communication there's another door to open there's another door to open and it's not like we finally get the final answer i mean one of the interesting things in working with these technologies and talking to people who work with them and looking at the history of them and i don't mean to say this to sound it like in a cynical way except to say that it works so infrequently that either we're not very good at it or the spirits aren't very good at it or there's something still about what we're really talking about is, yes, you know, we, we've we created, people have, are creating and manipulating technologies to try to get at these realities. And yet really all we're getting are glitches. Once in a while, it seems something kind of breaks through. But there's no way to construct a perfectly cohesive cosmology of how the universe, how the spirit world works based on, say, reading everything there is to read about electronic voice phenomena or spirit photography. There's a really funny example of that in one of the early in the spiritualist newspaper. I think it was called The Banner. The at the turn of the century, they channel a spirit to ask how spirit photography works. And the spirit essentially says, you're just not evolved enough to understand how it works. You'd have to be on this side of of the spirit world to be able to understand how we manipulate the camera to show ourselves. So this is a sense that even then there was people people couldn't it, it was too difficult to try to create a map or some kind of schematic diagram of how all this works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. These kinds of devices work, sometimes they don't. But more importantly, it seems that we we keep, like you're saying, that with every new technology, we're, we're seeing, well, maybe it's this way if we manipulate the letters of the keyboard. I know somebody who uses, you know, when you go into a new website and it asks for the CAPTCHA thing where you have to oh, yeah. try. Oh, yeah. yeah, so a, a friend of mine uh, Donna Hogan, actually, she's, uh, she's in the book. She talks about using that as kind of a Ouija board, where if you keep refreshing the page and getting a different capture word, you can have a spirit try to interact with you by stringing together the words that, that are rendered each time you refresh the page. That's an interesting idea, but most of the time when I get CAPTCHAs, they're a random collection of letters and numbers. They're not always like real words. That's right, but just like with um, ghost radios, you're often having to re... You're also then having to do some permutation of what you've seen to render them into a reasonable thing that can be read. I mean, this goes to some of the the more complex ways in which some of this plays out. If you look at some of the videos for electronic voice phenomena examples... Somebody will take their radio and they'll turn it on and they'll do the white noise or the way in which the radio you 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 hack your radio so that the that as it's trying to find a station automatically it doesn't actually stop and so you just get the bits of words here and there as it goes along the spectrum as it sort of goes along the frequencies and so somebody will take that on YouTube and they'll listen to it and then they'll speak back to it and what you'll see on the screen is when they edited the video, they sub they, they caption what is heard, what they hear from the radio. And now suddenly you already are going in with an idea of what is said. And it's impossible to not hear that when you see the caption. So I did a couple of experiments where I would watch these same videos. And before I looked at the caption, I would close my eyes, listen to what was heard, and try to write it down. And it was never what was on the captions. But once you saw the captions, 
that was it. It was impossible to hear anything else. So the ways in which our minds look for those patterns is something that people can do even with the CAPTCHA thing. So, you know, it's like, you know, those puzzles, people put them up on Facebook where it's just a jumble of words in like in a in an array. And it says the first three words you see will be what your year will be like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like that. So you take a bunch of phrases and you look at it long enough and words will start to render. And then you could pull out what you might perceive as a as a message from the spirits. I always see love when I look for that kind of stuff. Good. That's yeah, great. I know. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, hey, let me read an anecdote from your, your book here because it sort of maybe ties in here. But uh, you wrote that the 1933 Plu Television Limited advertisement introduced their TV sets by announcing it is here. And you equated that to, uh, you know, like maybe something out of the, the Toby Hooper film Poltergeist. And then you said that the ad goes on to describe this model number one TV as this. The magic eye, the enchanted mirror, the fantastic dream of ancient witches who were burnt for their dreaming. And Peter, as they say incredible? on the street, it's incredible. Like, but as they say on the streets, man, the fuck is this? Is this real? <laughs> were, they, were they advertising this TV that way for real? Yes, they were. And uh, this is exactly the case in which you see trying to apply spiritual ideas, pulling them into the into the technology. So my uh, one of the lines I also quote in the in the book is one of my favorites, which is the title of the introduction, which is when Belloc is trying to convince Indiana Jones in the Raiders of Lost Ark why the Ark is such an incredible thing and not just an archaeological artifact. He says, it's a transmitter, a radio for speaking to God. And so it's this that he recognizes the need to impose these metaphors in sort of all these different directions, right? So in this case, we're pulling these early pre-technological metaphors to make sense of the new technology. And in Belloc's case, he's trying to impose contemporary technological metaphors on this ancient, what he considers an ancient device. And it's, it's just absolutely fascinating that people wanted, that this company would want the consumers to believe that the television was somehow something magical. Well, and yeah, and, and to that point, you also said this, radio communication uh, first realized with the telegraph ignited the imagination, and you cited the work of Cromwell Fleetwood Varley. What was his contribution to this, you know, ignited imagination that you were referring to in the book there? Well, I think it's, again, this idea that somehow these new technologies can actually be the means through which we can have new and more advanced methods of, of communication with the spirit world. Rather than something that closes the door on the spirit world, they actually are a, a new means through which we can have an even better experience with these things. And what's interesting about that, and I think in some ways about the whole of, of this story writ large in the book, is that the, think about how the scientific, not the technological, but the scientific knowledge that makes something like a telegraph possible is built on a system of ideas and thoughts which would also argue that spirits do not exist. And so the science that makes the technology that we use to try to interact with spirits says you can't. <laughs> and yet we're still using those tools in a way that they weren't necessarily intended for. And I think that is getting also at the heart of what I hope is apparent in this book, that using tools for which they were not intended is what in some ways magic is. And it's why I link the magician and the idea of the hacker as something that I see as, as, as acting on a very similar spectrum of activity. And so this idea that you would take the thing and you would rejigger it, you would repurpose it for some spiritual for some spiritual activity is important, not only because you are having to kind of reimagine something in a way that the culture that 
either made it possible or is the gatekeeper of would tell you that you can't or shouldn't do, but you're actually having to step outside of these traditional and orthodox ways of thinking to do something that might ultimately be seen as dangerous, as heterodox, maybe even crazy and irrational. Well, tell us a bit about Varley's background, this because he was a spiritualist and the way that he described, I guess, the intent of what he saw the, the telegraph being used for was very spiritual. Yeah, I mean, so he was an engineer and he was involved in actually, you know, doing the work of the, the cable lane for the transatlantic communication telegraph system. And he sort of really thought that why, I, I mean, in some ways you would think it would completely make sense that if we are able to transmit our voices across the ocean, why can't voices be transmitted through the ether across space and time and maybe across dimensions? Now, you have to remember, though, you're not starting with somebody who doesn't believe in spirits, invents the telegraph or is part of the engineering of the telegraph, and then says, this makes me think spirits might exist. He's already going in with the belief. And so he's merely doing what, what in some ways the Pew advertisement is doing or what Belloc is doing in the movie, is he's now applying the technology to an already embedded spiritual beliefs that he has. But it makes sense that he would do that, because if your worldview is one in which spirits exist, it would only make sense that human ingenuity would make it possible for us to have an interaction like that in a way that we couldn't before. And so human technology does not, again, does not close the door on the spirit world. It actually could potentially open a window that hadn't existed before. The magician is doing that also in terms of their magical practice in that they are something has said this door is closed and the magician is saying no actually by performing these particular operations by using this spiritual technology i can open up that i can open up that window have you ever seen like the uh the ley lines maps you know where they I guess they built the railroads over them, right? Is that true? Oh, yeah, I have seen maps of that. That's really fascinating. Yeah, and I, th I don't know if that really applies here to this conversation, but it's not something that you wrote about. But uh, if you think about that, you know, like they they knew that there was something to those those energy grids of, of some sort that they wanted to, you know, use them for transportation. Peter, you're in Massachusetts. I'm in Ohio. How are we hearing each other's voice right now? Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, why? yeah absolutely. So let's transition a little bit into some of the really, really cool sort of DIY anecdotes in the book. Peter, what is a golem and have you tried to make one? The golem is the legendary creature made of mud, typically constructed by a rabbi or other Jewish mystic. The, the most popular story is the golem of Prague, which we see in all kinds of other makes its way into all kinds of legends. Even the Brothers Grimm did a version of it. And essentially, the Jews of Prague are being really harassed and killed in these pogroms by the Gentiles. And so the Jewish people go to the rabbi and they beg him to help them. And so he constructs a creature out of mud and writes a sacred word or name, depending on the story, on the golem's forehead, on the creature's forehead, it comes to life, it goes out, it starts killing all the Gentiles, it goes on a rampage, the people come back and say, stop, we just, we just wanted the pogroms to end, we didn't want to become massacres ourselves, please stop the golem, and then there's a couple of different ways in which that happens, and one of the legends the golem has gotten so tall that the rabbi has to climb a ladder he erases the word on its forehead and it crumbles and crushes him there's another where the golem just goes to sleep 
and is interned in the attic of the synagogue in Prague. And, you know, some say it's st- it's still there to this day, waiting to one day be awoken when the Jewish people are, you know, ready uh, to use it wisely or whatever the, again, whatever the moral of the tale might be. So that's sort of the legendary story almost gives it a kind of a folk tale kind of monster story that, you know, of course, becomes very much a part of the legends of Jewish folk life, like the Dibbuk and, you know, all, Lilith and all these other creatures that inhabit the Jewish mythological and magical landscape. But we actually have texts, actual mystical and, and rabbinical texts, which describe formula for making golems. There's a, uh, a wonderful, even very early in, in the Talmud, there's a story of these mystics coming to a rabbi and showing them their creation of the golem. And the rabbi says, well, what can it do? Can it speak? And they say, well, it can't speak. And he says, well, then it's just a, it's, it's just a, a toy. It's nothing. It's, it's useless. So what's interesting in the, the difference between these two tales is that in the mystical tradition of the golem, the golem is really intended for a spiritual magical experiment, not really necessarily for any purpose except for the doing of it. Whereas in the legend of the golem that's more popular, the golem is actually almost like a Frankenstein monster. And so I find that 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 dichotomy is very interesting. And so I was curious about knowing that it would be very unlikely I could make a man of mud and write some Hebrew letters on it and it would come to life. I was curious about, well, what would it mean to investigate this other way of making a golem through these spiritual activities, these magical activities? And I found that even there, it would be an impossible task. The mystical requirements for doing something as described in some of these these early texts about how to make a golem essentially describe sitting for sometimes days at a time, having to chant 42,000 different permutations of God's name, you know, just things that are, I think, absurd, maybe even purposefully written as absurdly impossible as a lesson to show that trying to do something like this, only God can do. Right. So it, 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 it's the kind of activity that when you set out to do it, you realize the absurdity of it and it keeps you humble, maybe, that you ever thought that you could do it in the first place. Yeah. And tell us a bit about the connection that you made in the book between golems, servitors, robots. You sort of group these all into the same category, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I think that they are all exist on a spectrum of the human the, the, the human being attempting to create a semblance of life outside of themselves, whether through a material object like a golem, in the case of the Legend of Prague, like the Frankenstein monster, like an artificial intelligence, like an, like an automaton, but even in a spiritual sense, like a servitor or a tulpa or some entity through which through some magical uh, and again human engineered operation that we can we can activate some form of life in that way and what's interesting is that they do come out slightly different i mean there's different means i think it's important that the golem for example is about earth and language is what activates it. Frankenstein isn't really from scratch, right? The Frankenstein monster is of pre-existing body parts, a pre-existing brain, and really just using electricity to reignite life that was already had already been there. But then you look at things like, uh, which I have a whole chapter on, the idea of the clockwork beautiful clockwork mechanisms, you know, called it the automaton, 
in which you're really trying to from scratch see if you can imitate the functions of life, whether it's writing on a table or playing a flute. There's even the story of a duck uh, by a, uh, a, tom- a clockmaker named Vokasan who created a duck that would actually digest and then poop out a little pellet because <laughs> he wanted to see if he could, could he mechanically perfectly imitate internal human bodily functions. And for a long time, though, people were very frightened of these these clockwork creatures because they thought, first of all, human beings are not supposed to do this. This is God's work. And if it does appear to be alive or maybe is alive, it probably has to be some demonic thing that's enchanting it or that's propelling it. And so there were a lot of superstitions around this idea that we can create life outside of ourselves. Even an imitation of life is something that we should be careful of. And and that, you might argue, even goes back to this idea that we are not, that in the Bible, one of the commandments is that we're not supposed to create graven images, right? That that somehow once you do that, you've activated some part of of the divine that we're not supposed to do. And yet we've always done it. We've drawn the animals on caves. Aaron makes the golden calf, even when Moses tells him not to do that. And he does it, he says, because the people need some material representation of the divine. And so again, there's that that quality of this that just is so part of our human spiritual identity that we've been struggling with and trying to make sense of, I think, for as long as we've been, you know, drawing animals on the walls of caves. Yeah, and that also kind of conjures up memories of the movie Weird Science, which I'm sure you've seen. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) Just another cool little anecdote here, but you were talking at one point in the book about an automaton built to resemble a swan, and Mark Twain, of all people, saw this swan, and his view of it was that it exposed a concern that mechanical objects might have a soul, a spirit that is essential to its function, which is what you've been talking about. And I thought yes. that was really cool, you know, that Mark Twain, of all people, saw this swan and had that thought. And, I mean, he, I guess he did have some spiritual leanings himself, but still, I mean, you know, it was an interesting point made in the book there. Yes, I mean, I think it's really, it's important to know that when we're talking about, so, you know, I think while a lot of the book deals with things like actual spirit communication via radios or taking pictures of spirits, that this other important way in which we've we've tried to interact with the with the divine or with the with the quote supernatural or with the spirit world is not necessarily about communication but seeing if we can somehow capture it or encapsulate it or give it a a place to become manifest in our lives and the automaton is a way in which people maybe thought that if you could get close enough to the semblance of life that there was just a little tiny bit of spark of something that we could call a soul that made this possible. And, and again, whether or not it is, that it happened in a literal way, it's enough that for a moment, Mark Twain saw in this thing, something soulful. And that's that ambiguous enchanted place that I think that we've lost. The fact that Mark Twain could just say for a moment, he was struck by the idea that this mechanical swan could have a soul and allowed himself to be enchanted, allowed himself to live in that amb- ambiguity, I think is is really the power of magic. So tell us a bit about your personal DIY golem experiment. So it didn't go anywhere because I was in no way prepared to do the kind of spiritual ecstatic exercises needed. It would take a lifetime of mystical practice and Kabbalistic knowledge, which I can barely read Hebrew. But what I wanted to know was how could I understand it as a metaphor? The other thing I wanted to find out is if in any time during the 18th, 19th, or even 20th century, if there are any records within 
this sort of more closed rabbinical or even Hasidic or Kabbalistic communities if anybody ever tried to attempt to actually create a physical golem. And I talked to this rabbi in um, Israel, and he essentially said that if you want to believe that the golem of Prague is real, that's, that's the only golem that's ever been created. And that the purpose of the golem now is to find what he described as the golem inside of ourselves. That we should, we should understand ourselves to be God's golem, as it were. And that the exercises intended to create a golem are really exercises to understand the relationship that by trying to have a relationship with a creation outside of ourself is to help us understand our relationship to the divine as a creative act of God's. And so this idea, though, that we can imitate God as creators, I think, is also part of this hacking spirit that we start to see show up metaphorically in some very important ways. And so, for example, in the whole Earth catalog, which came out in, I believe, 69 or 70, which was the attempt to really merge counterculture spiritual and ecological ideas about the world with a burgeoning technological culture. And Stuart Brand, who was the original creator of the Whole Earth Catalog, the inscription when you open the book is something like, become as gods now, we may as well get used to it. And so this idea that via our intersection of spiritual and technological know-how, we can, we can do this work. And so I think that's, that's an important way, again, of thinking about. So, so, the, so trying to build a golem really only, ex, really, ex, again, expose the idea of the, of the mystic and the magician really as a hacker and vice versa, the hacker and the maker as performing a kind of magic in the world insofar as they are performing the famous dictum, which is magic is the art and science of causing change to occur in the world via our will. And if you, I mean, I can't think of anything that that's doing that more than Steve Jobs sitting in his basement with his buddies trying to invent a computer that seems to me a, a pretty you know and again doing it outside of conventional methods and that's really the key too that you're working outside of convention that you're pushing up against the mainstream's ideas of what's possible that you're having to break in order to build something new that you're having to uh, reimagine what is considered to be the proper way of doing things and doing them in a way that people would say is even dangerous, that I think that that's a, an important way of linking these ideas and to see that essentially they're just, they're just part of the human, they're just part of human activity that, that trying to do magic or, or activate the occult imagination and trying to invent something is I think a part of a, a very is on a spectrum of of what it means to be human. Absolutely. Sorry if that was a little preachy. No, no, I thought that was really <laughs> cool. Yeah, I thought that was a really good answer, man. So I got one final question for you here, man, and it's one that you actually posed yourself in the book. You didn't answer it in the book, and if you can't answer it now, that's fine too. But you pose this question: Should we use technology to quicken the pace towards spiritual states of being? I just want to get your take on that. Yeah, this gets to the to asking the question that I was working with fellow Mitch in the book about using can we use drugs in that way? At what point is technology a window into what's possible, but then we need to go and do the work which requires maybe more traditional spiritual exercises? like ritual, meditation, prayer, 
And so I wonder if, again, technology can be a window into these into these realities, into these states of being. But if we want to then move forward into an ethically realized spiritual life, we might need more than the technology. Just like we're finding technology today in our regular world doesn't necessarily afford us an ethical foundation. The technology allows us a lot of incredible makes a lot of incredible things possible, makes a lot of things easy, makes a lot of ideas accessible. You know, you can read the entire Western and 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 beyond canon online for all intent and purposes. Any part of knowledge you could ever want is available via technology. But if it doesn't induce in us an ethical, actual lived experience, then what good was it? And so, yes, technology for the purposes of inducing states of consciousness that inspire and activate that part of ourselves, I think, is incredibly valuable. But then what? Just like drugs might activate those states of consciousness, just like anything might. But then how do we live? How do we live a good life? How do we become good to each other and and good to people? I think sometimes might require us then uh, again moving into still having at our disposal those tried and true methods of of living a spiritual life and and sometimes it just means about you know just not being a jerk which i i think we've all lost you know any semblance of it's become so easy to do that these days and and in some ways technology has made that even more possible and so like anything it can be a danger and so i think it's that we should treat it like we do with the same level of recognizing that it is a tool, but it may not be, it may not be the actual path as it were. Well, it's like any sort of tool or energy source or whatever. It's all inherently neutral. And then we come into these experiences with the ability to either use it for good or use it for bad. So it's yeah. really on, it's really just user preference, I suppose. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. So Peter, Hey, this has been really cool, man. I'm glad you have made some time to take us through your latest book here, Strange Frequencies. Tell people where they can find it if they're interested and where they can keep up with you on the internet. Sure. Well, I I hope that you could find it at your local independent bookstore. I'm sure they could order it for you, but it's certainly available at any of the online uh, retail places where you normally buy books. And you can find me on Twitter. And if you look for me on Twitter, my email address is there and I'd be happy to correspond with anybody. And yeah, those probably the best. That's probably the best way. And if you want to put any of my information, you know, with the podcast, that would be great. We'll absolutely do that in the show notes for sure. Peter Biebergall, thanks again, man. Really appreciate you hanging out. For Ryan, thank you. you. It's so great to do this again with you. Absolutely, man. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. And there you have it. My thanks again to Peter Biebergall. What a timely chat this is, all seasons considered. And what a timely book, too, all technologies available to us considered. This is one of those chats that reminds me of my youth and how I got here, the steps I took in my own journey. Obviously, it was a personal, almost nostalgic journey for Peter as well, but it's also something that reminds us that whatever lies ahead for us can always help re-enchant our lives and our shared universe here, but only if we use the tools at our disposal with the most positive of intentions. Hey, there was one quote from Peter's book that I wasn't able to work into the chat because it was quite lengthy, but I figured I'd share it here because I liked it so much, so make of it what you will. Peter wrote that, quote, The supernatural and occult imagination becomes the locus where the tension between the material world and the world of the spirit is realized and is then dissolved. Pop culture is only one arena that empowers every desire and every anxiety regarding a supernatural reality. Even as music, film, novels, and comics are the perfect vehicles to practice spiritual rebellion and engage with that part of the human experience that desires a direct encounter with the divine, the occult imagination is also the location where superstition, conspiracy theories, and fear of the demonic manifest. The occult imagination is vast, and not only includes our desire for divine knowledge, but encompasses the fear of that knowledge. To commit heresy necessitates a universe that can be profaned. 
Then there are the more cynical uses of the occult imagination, involving those who have duped others into believing in supernatural forces. But the occult imagination is also one that sees these beliefs and practices as folly, either dangerous, duplicitous, or self-deluding. Nevertheless, it is not necessary to believe in life after death or divination or any kind of miracle to engage with the supernatural. Even when we turn our attention to these ideas in order to debunk them, we are still participants. We give them life by asking the questions. End quote. In the Patreon extension, we talked about performance and it being the most potent form of magic. We talked about the role of emotion in magic, as well as stage magic and technology, how they go together, and Harry Houdini. Dug more into Peter's trip to a seance in New York. Chat a bit about Phantasmagoria and the television as the new Phantasmagoria. Got into the dream reality, the subconscious, and a contraption known as the dream machine. Also talked a bit about audio frequencies inducing out-of-body experiences. Touched on Peter's experiments with EVP for the book. And more about the analogy Peter made between magicians and hackers. And a ton, shit ton, of new patrons enjoyed, or hopefully enjoyed, that extension. Shoutouts and thanks to Sebastian, Cindy, Chris, Carrie, Hunter, Al, Michael, Jesse, Eddie, SC, Ryan, Jake, Jean-Francois, and Amanda. And a huge thank you to John, Paul, Andy, and Thought Criminal, a.k.a. DH Slammer, a.k.a. Mute Ryan, for becoming official executive producers of the show. If you'd like to hear this extension and all others like it past and future, sign up at patreon.com slash occulture for as little as two bucks a month. And for these October episodes, you're not only getting the extensions with the guests, you're also getting extensions with the intros to the show, which include Halloween-related dance music and a story from yours truly that builds throughout each episode. So if that sounds like a jam worth jamming to, patreon.com slash occulture is your DJ. Anyway, I'll be back real soon with another full-length episode. So until then, you've just been initiated into occulture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh,